Welcome to the November 2022 edition of the Lawrence University Career Center podcast. I'm Laura Hookstra, filling in for Ty Collins, and today we are joined by Jacob Dalton and his producing partner, Adam Moses. Jacob graduated from Lawrence in 2017 after majoring in theater arts with a minor in creative writing. He currently works as a filmmaker in Los Angeles. Jacob and Adam have recently completed their first feature film titled Dangerous, which will be privately pre-screened at Lawrence University on Sunday, November 13th and Monday, November 14th. Thank you for joining me, Jacob and Adam. Our pleasure. Glad to be here. Happy to be here. All right. So the Lawrence community is really excited for our private viewing of Dangerous. So just in general, what is the movie about? Dangerous is about a guy named Theo Trozen. He's a, uh, I like to call him a motorcycle riding cowboy. You know, he's, uh, he's, he's very much a religious vigilante that's, that has a quest to uh, defeat evildoers in the southern Appalachian Mountains. And essentially what happens is he's injured in this fight and he has to take refuge in a backwoods motel. Uh, little does he know the motel's owner, who's this like sweet as pie southern belle, is a serial killer. <laughs> And she's <laughs> planning to uh, seduce, torture, and murder him. And the most of the movie takes place in this in this motel deep in the woods. So was, you know, I know the Lawrence community loves their like deep themes, their Plato Republic stuff. So um, besides, that's the basic plot. But uh, you know, in essence, it's a uh, it's this Greek myth retold in a Southern Gothic kind of atmosphere. And there's a lot of themes of religion and justice. Um, you know, uh, female power, stuff like that. That are kind of centered around uh, the three main characters, Theo, the serial killer, Polly, and then the the killer's niece, Lily, who is this like entrapped uh, woman in the motel. I would definitely say like the theme overall is like, you know, freedom versus the familiar because there can be safety in the familiar, but also that familiar thing could be toxic. It could be poisonous to you. And so, you know, you, you weigh the risks of, freedom and the danger that freedom offers up as well against the uh the world that you know that may be the thing that just keep holding you back you could say the road ahead is a little dangerous even there you go that's right the road ahead's a little dangerous. Uh, yeah <laughs> uh, yeah thank you oh i can't wait to see it i'm really excited so uh, we can't wait to show it to you honestly we're I, I think everyone's a little proud of their own baby i mean adam and i have watched this movie you know a couple hundred times in all of the <laughs> stages. And I think that we enjoy it every single time. So yeah. we're really excited to to share it with some people and especially like the Lawrence students. And How um, how long did it take to make the film? And could you just maybe tell us a little bit more about the production of it in particular? Um, you know, how many people worked on it? You know, maybe who did you collaborate with? Maybe just kind of walk us through the process of making the movie in general. So I wrote the first draft of Dangerous in 2019 and I wrote it uh, for someone else. You know, it was like, it was my project, but I was like hoping to get involved in a different uh, series of short films. Yeah. So it's been, it's been three years essentially since I wrote the first draft, which was about 15 pages long. And then over COVID, I lived in Tennessee for a while, like where Dangerous is, takes place. And I added <laughs> 15 more pages to it. Basically, <laughs> I made it like a full, essentially uh, pilot length script or mini feature. It was what the like January 2021, I hit up Adam and I was like, this is the year that we make this movie. We've been sitting on it for about a year and a half. Like, uh, let's make it. I entered a bunch of screenwriting competitions for it. I won a couple of bigger awards that kind of like raised the hype in just kind of like our personal group uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, we attached Adam as director and producer a couple other people as producers and we cast our actors and then we uh, raised money using Indiegogo. So I know this seems like a really long process and it, it is, you know, it's like from writing then to raising money, we raised money using crowdfunding. A lot of people in the Lawrence community helped out with that a lot. We finished raising the money about a year ago, a year and a couple months ago, a couple weeks ago. And we shot it in November of last year, about literally about one, a year ago. Yeah, so you like want to take over? October, early November, something like that. Yeah. And uh, so we brought on, I think the first step for us was like making sure that the vision could come to life for it, which like, you know, obviously was a, a big collaboration between Jacob and I on that front, like kind of sharing what I'm seeing with Jacob and make sure we are on the same page about telling the same story. And like, once we were, a DP that I've worked with on my last two short films, uh, Caleb Harris 
is an absolute wizard with the camera and he's just awesome at what he does. And he was, he more than stepped up to the plate to kind of help it come to life. I'd say like, you know, he, he went above and beyond, not just for the, the look of the film, but like he brought on all of his people and, you know, he became a producer by <laughs> mid, by mid shoot, you know, he was already wow. so involved at that level, but uh, yeah, Caleb Harris and, uh, you know, our cool. awesome gaffer, Samantha, and uh, Chris and Talon, just a whole bunch of amazing camera side people. Peyton did our VFX. Yeah, it was just everybody that that joined was genuinely excited to be a part of it. And that was for sure why we had such a smooth shoot. We shot, shot it all in six days, uh, two on location in the forest, and then the rest were at different locations uh, in Los Angeles that we kind of pieced together the whole story despite it all supposedly being at one location in the woods, but we made it work. Yeah, that it was for sure the smoothest shoot and longest shoot. And to have that little problems on a shoot that large, uh, not compared to studios, but compared to indie film, I feel like we definitely had a very solid crew and solid schedule and all of that. And to have what the worst thing that happened was uh, our drone operator drove off with the lighter and then came back like an hour later. Yeah, we like we didn't we, have the lighter for an hour or two. <laughs> yeah, we were never more than than an hour behind, which is uh, in film standards really, really abnormal. Um, most most films run, you know, two hours behind every day, and it's kind of like this mad rush to like get it done. So we were really blessed, you know. Just speaking of people we worked with, like some shout outs, like we have our line producer Soph Puchley, um, our casting director and associate producer is this Lauren Beausoleil, both really good friends of ours who you know helped bring this to life and like really especially on the casting side, like we never would have found our, our actors without Warren. So yep. uh, big, big shout out to them if, if they listen. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just the six days was, it was like, it was like the best times of our lives, but you know, it's always like shooting a movie isn't easy, right? It's like, it's really fast paced, a really great environment. I wanted to mention just a quick little story uh, based on what Adam said of like piecemealing things together. Uh, there's one scene and when we watched the movie, Laura, I'll point it out, but there's a scene where two characters are having a dialogue through a doorway and one side of the doorway is one set and one side of the doorway is the other. And so we'd shot them on two different days, but they look like they're the same set. Wow. <laughs> and I like, you know, it's like the magic of filmmaking, right? We never had more than about 25 people on set at any given time. Uh, the cast is pretty small. There was only like five actors in total. And then, yeah, so like 20 to 25 people every day. Uh, in total, the film costs 35 grand with with pre post and all that. And so then, yeah, after production, we went to post production and uh, took a year, a year of time to get it edited um, with special effects and everything else that goes into it. Just a little under a year, actually, as far as post. That's true. Yeah, uh, we, but still, it was very much like we shot and then it went into the holiday season. And so it was this huge lull of not really touching anything. And then when we finally got back into it, it was a slow pick, which eventually we're like, let's get it done. And then we sat down we probably had what that one Sunday, we sat down for like eight hours and did 90% of the editing that needed to be done, like to really put it in the direction it should go. And then uh, we were able to knock it out pretty consistently at that point. But that's actually the start of Jacob and I's like official collaboration as partners was uh, we're like, hey, this is great. Look how much work we got done. We love doing this. Why don't we do it full time? Yeah. Do you yeah. want to pick up the rest of the story? Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a funny story. So I figured we might as well tell it. Um, yeah. We did this editing session. I had a job working at a school. I was working at Caltech as an assistant and it was a Sunday. We edited for eight hours. We we're like, this is lovely. Let's do this the whole time. And Adam was like, yeah, man, like maybe in like in a couple months, we should like consider just starting this production company and going into business full time. And I was like, yeah, I'll consider that. Like it's, you know, what I've always wanted to do. Let me make some money and whatever. And then the next day I went into work and I got in trouble for like the biggest, you know, thing that I did not care about. Biggest BS, you know, kind of like literally got sent to the principal's office because I worked for the <laughs> dean and I, uh, I was sitting there and I was like, ah, uh, yeah, I'm going to quit by the way. And I quit that day. I was like, I'll give you, I'll, I'll like, this is my two weeks notice essentially. And I got out of the meeting and I called Adam and I was like, well, we're doing this now. Uh, <laughs> and we started the production company a month later and you know by god it's going good um thank god yeah yeah so yeah that's the, that's the whole dangerous process i mean like and it's crazy because we're not even 
close to being done yet, right? We still have a year of festivals and marketing that we have to get through to, you know, really uh, make it the full scope of the project and like work on getting the next one. So when you look back at the making of Dangerous, what do you find most rewarding about the experience? That's a hard one to answer. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost like a who's your favorite kid kind of yeah. question, yeah. you know, like which child is your favorite? I would say personally, the most rewarding part <clears throat> At this point, if I can answer that question today, what I feel most satisfied about is the fact that it's complete and it is long form. And there isn't anything I would have done different looking back. It's only the matter of, we had the resources we had, so we did it this way. But like truly realizing like we came in with a a goal and a vision, and then that vision has come to life on the screen as intended. Always a little different than you imagine initially, but about as close as you can get. Uh-huh. I mean, as a writer, like it's it's it is irreplaceable to watch your words get immortalized. Like, you know, I'm not saying like dangerous is going to be watched in a hundred years or anything, but like in in, a, in the same way, it's like it's 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 never going away, you know. And so it's like watching watching actors who we cast to play characters that I created in my mind. Like, you know, like people where I was like, you're not a real person, but now you are like, it's just, and you're saying these words that, you know, were not real words, but now they're, you know, on screen. It's just like, it's incredible. Like it's truly, a, it's truly a, an amazing experience. Um, yeah. Definite shout out to the actors for like yeah. living in the skin so well, you know, like we were really lucky and casting was the longest part of the whole process. That was just, we had to get it right. If we had, they had to have the right, feel and look and performance and all that stuff and we just got really lucky everybody is the character in that way that it's hard to separate some actors from the role i i almost in a way hope you know that it feels that way when you watch the film that the actors are like you can almost not separate them from who this character is because they they really lived in the skin of it so not everyone gets this lucky there's definitely like there's the aspect of just like making it happen for for filmmaking but like we we definitely got really lucky at every step of the way you know we found the right people had the right team yeah so yeah <laughs> so so would you say your process was pretty typical then to the filmmaking process in general or Were there some things that you maybe did differently than other people might have? I would say that we are uh, definitely young and indie. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) That would be our biggest difference. I think that, you know, uh, and, and cheap, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, <laughs> it's, it looks great. Like, don't, the, you're going to see the movie and you're going to be like, this is, this is low budget, but like, you know, there are certain things that just like have to happen because you don't have the money for it. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's a great, it's a great it's question. By industry standards, that's for sure. Like if you have, if that's the definition of typical, I don't think that most filmmakers as a percentage would know what typical actually is, but from that indie standpoint, I definitely think there's a process that works for us that we followed in whatever the time frame was needed because we were all doing separate things at the time. Pretty much every department is squeezing in dangerous in between the other parts of their life. Uh, only now have Jacob and I kind of made this full time. And the process has remained very similar uh, going from dangerous into like our work as a production company, but we just have reduced the timelines and deliveries and all of that stuff because now it's, a full-time uh, endeavor. But uh, I would say that, you know, we try to hit as many boxes as we can and then wear all the hats because you have to. And typically you probably would wear one hat. In the indie world, you're wearing at least three or four, so. Yeah, that's that's pretty true. I think like if you like took the basic structure, you know, like, oh, pre-production, production, post-production marketing. Like, yeah, those are all like the same as any movie, but the fact that we're in charge of all of them <laughs> is really the uh, really the biggest difference. You know, like in an ideal world, Adam and I would be executive producers and maybe director, writer. And then every, all the other, the countless jobs we did on set as well, we wouldn't be doing. You know, we'd have someone better at us. Than <laughs> doing, yeah. Like exactly. cost, co- costuming, production design, stuff like that. I think that's the best answer. But like you do what you got to do, right? You know, one thing that like I want to talk to the students about when I get there is it doesn't really matter that you don't know what you're doing. Like you have to do it if you want to see the project get done, right? It's like we had a costume consultant who was wonderful, um, Jenny Newman. She was great. 
uh, but she couldn't be on set. We didn't have the money for it. And it was like, so we're the ones like picking out the clothing. We're the ones being like, okay, you're going to put on this shirt. And remember, like the blood stain was here. And, but you just got to do it, right? Like you got to make the project happen because at the end of the day, it's like, are you going to wait until you have the money? Or are you going to do the project? Definitely better to do it at our level than not do it at all. I'd also go on to add, which I think is part of the conversation in general uh, about just doing it is that I feel like part of, at least from the, maybe the director side, I feel like I've had a lot of conversations with fellow directors where there's a, a very perfectionist mindset because you have this vision, you have this idea and it's got this flow and this pace. That's what makes you the director, right? Because somebody else's pace and flow and style is different, but they're telling the same script. So in a way, aiming for perfection, but not caring about the result as much is the only way to get through. And like, that's kind of what it was. It's like, we are going to make this the best we possibly can, but we've got 35 grand. So let's, let's see what, what, what we can do with that. And a lot of the time it took, it took me a while personally as director to like let go of that expectation in my head until I could do things. Like I would probably shot I shot my first short film and I didn't shoot anything else for another two and a half years. From that was another like year and a half. And then I had a couple in that year and then I had dangerous. And so things have, I started to let go of my own sense of this has to be perfect because I kept realizing my next project is better and it's better because I've improved my craft. And it doesn't mean that the first thing I made, which I happen to be extremely proud of. Right. And this, I can absolutely say this is better, but at the same time, I'm still proud of my old work, you know? And so just kind of aiming upward with action, you know, like I'm going to step up to the plate. I am going to film this is the only way for you to look forward to the next thing and not regret the last one. Just a, one last little tag on that. I know we're a little off topic, but I think it's really good for the Lawrence listeners too, right? It's a very like high achiever school. Like lots of students are coming out of high school with like straight A's and they're going to hit college and it's going to be a lot harder. And, you know, in the real world, even, even harder than that. And you just kind of have to like, you just got to move forward. You got to let go and like do the projects. And it's, it's the difference between people that are making their dreams come true and the people that are kind of stuck. I think that's a really good tidbit. I, Cause definitely a lesson that I should have learned at, at 21. You've already delved into this quite a bit already, but just as independent filmmakers without the support of a large studio, can you just talk maybe a little bit more about some of those challenges um, that creates and, and how you overcome them? Um, uh, I mean, and also, do you um, do you one day aspire to um, maybe make major motion pictures and, and work with a larger studio? Or do you want to stay in the indie? A resounding <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, big yes. Big yeah, yes. Uh, I, I, I think you'd have to be freaking crazy to not want to do that. Uh, I, I think that the, uh, the appeal of staying in the indie world still only exists within the studio framework, really, because there's indie filmmakers that are like us, you know, we're making our own thing. People, like if we were to post it on YouTube, 20, we'd get 26 views, kind of, you know, <laughs> like because we, we don't have any way of distributing the work we're doing. A lot of the argument is that the indie film can remain creative and original and then the studio film has to like, you know, fit into all of these boxes and, you know, be desirable to a world audience and all of that stuff. I don't think that that's the case with the studio system. Studios are pumping out more content and more films than they ever have because of subscriptions and streaming services and the like. So as long as you have the stuff, so to speak, like you've got the material, I would say that the a studio system can give you that creative freedom because of the resources, like all of the things that we, that we struggled with were purely a money related situation. You know, it's like, there is no way to ask people for favors because we have such a tremendous goal to achieve. You know, it's unfair to ask somebody to come in and disappear for a week of their life and, you know, not walk away with anything other than potentially some footage in a year after it's edited. So like the ability to connect with people to make the best product requires capital. And the studio system is currently the one that has the most capital. So 100%, we would like to have the capital and any story we'd like to tell, I'm pretty sure we'll tell it to the best of our ability. The cynicism side of me is like the biggest, as Adam said, biggest problem is just money. Right. And it's like, 
films are art, but it's also one of the largest industries in the world, right? It's, it's, it's a capitalist system, right? And so, um, you know, for better or for worse, but good movies have a lot of money behind them. There's great movies that don't have a lot of money. Like I always bring up like Rocky, uh, but the Rocky budget was still like $4 million, which by movie standards is nothing like literally like, like pennies in comparison to like, you know, you know, Avengers Endgame, you know, whatever hundred mil bill or whatever it was, you know? So definitely yes. Want to do studio films would love to do more indie films in the future if they have funding. But there was a second half of that question, right? Was it like, uh, what, what are some of the caveats of the indie filmmaking world? Is that correct? Yeah, or just other challenges and how you overcome them. It's time management. That's 100% the biggest indie concern. I would say that you could make that short film that ends up winning awards at the at film festivals that just you and your camera in a room with some really creative choices and a cool story. But I bet you that that guy took six years to get it on the screen because he never figured out when was a good time to get this after work and doing da 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 and then I'm writing the script and 7,000 rewrites and I've got to ask some friends and you know it's the ability to I would say the the number one thing that you should learn how to do as an indie filmmaker is understand what the elements of production are so that when you are writing your story or telling your story or any part you understand the so-called chain of command so that you know what roles you're going to step in or have to be replaced or are going to have to be yeah. on the list. But I feel like a lot of people, uh, like we get phone calls where they're like, yeah, just, you know, I got like this for that. And I'm like, well, you haven't thought about seven other things that are actually necessary for you to execute what you're saying uh, and not understanding what the process is and that that process is completely the same for any level of movie. It's just a numbers game is the biggest tip I would give a filmmaker. It's like, ask why you're doing it and what the process is each step of the way so that you know how to fix it. When you guys aren't making your own movies, um, what else do you do? So our, our business is not necessarily making our own movies. Uh, it will be, um, but we shoot mostly, uh, when we work, we're shooting mostly short form content. So like music videos, uh, actor reels, TikToks, um, and we're doing it at the highest quality. That's what we do for work, hobbies. I guess is mostly the question. Adam and I work out together. We both are big weightlifting fans. I personally do a lot of nerdy uh, Dungeons and Dragons esque live action role playing. Um, and then I'm acting. That's like my hobby now is acting, which is hilarious considering that's what I came out here to do originally. Yeah, my hobbies are well, it's funny because you go from making stuff to then watching stuff you know and that's basically the main cycle for me is like if i do have free time i'm either going to play music i've been a musician since i was a kid uh or i'm going to watch something to either turn my brain off or be engaged or whatever but the primarily nowadays that's my two hobbies but i guess you could count martial arts as another hobby but i really view that as more of part of my fitness regimen wellness but uh avid martial art practitioner uh currently doing jujitsu and boxing so Jacob, just in looking back at your time at Lawrence, what stands out as one or two key experiences that have really helped you to become successful? Wow, big question. Um, <laughs> I would say I was given a lot of leadership opportunities at school. You know, classes aside, uh, there's Lawrence is famous for its sheer amount of extracurricular activity. You know, I know most students are involved in like seven different clubs. Uh, I personally <laughs> was in uh, Delta Tau Delta fraternity did uh, Lawrence University Community Council, did was like my class rep, you know, chair of the wellness committee or, or the welfare committee, I can't remember which one. And just those leadership opportunities taught me a lot about getting along with people and, and being a good leader. And, you know, there's not much difference I've found between trying to keep the attention of 30, 20 year old men in the fraternity living room, trying to get through like a budget meeting and, doing a day on set in terms of like <laughs> leading people. I mean, like, you know, you can't yell at them, but you got to get their attention. You get like, you know, if I, you want a certain vote to pass or you want a certain shot to get done, like you have to like say the right things. And so like, I'm not saying it like taught me manipulation or anything like that, but like, <laughs> yeah, leadership opportunities totally. And like, I would encourage everyone, you know, to, to 
to take on a leadership opportunity while you're at Lawrence. Um, and then obviously I was in 18 productions. I mean, I did a ton of acting, ton of, you know, art and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I would say like the, one of the biggest benefits of college is just learning to get along with people and like understanding, like, you know, you can't just like bully your way through or like even get bullied, you know, in terms of being in a club or leadership or on set or whatever it is. Yeah. I would say that was like some of the big stuff from Lawrence. So for students who may wish to follow in your footsteps, what would you recommend that they do while they're still in college? If you are really interested in being a filmmaker, there is no reason why you aren't making a film. And that's like, I know that's like, everyone's going to be like, ah, like what? That's, <laughs> that's so stupid. I have no money. And it's, uh, but at Lawrence, especially my dad has this phrase that I really love. And I wish I had listened to it when I was younger, which is, uh, you are the richest you're ever going to be especially when you're young, right? If you're going to Lawrence, you live in a dorm, you have a roof over your head, you have the Warch Campus Center, you have like a thousand locations that would literally cost you thousands of dollars to rent. You have theaters, you have the Riston Auditorium, you have the VR, you have like, there's like a bar, like, yeah, I, the, the, VR, the VR is a bar, Adam, and like okay, you can yeah. shoot there. And like that bar would cost us two grand to rent for the night. You could get it for free, probably. You have LUCC literally with more money than it knows what to do with. Don't tell them I told you that. And <laughs> you could start a film club right now, get 10 grand probably or something crazy. Like you could get funding. It could be 500 bucks and that's enough for Crafty. Also, uh, that's Yeah, also the luxury of the college it, environment too is that if you do just make the film crap and you have no money you have people and locations which is yeah which is the money that's and that's i think when stepping out into the real world that's the difference the difference is that kind of people that are always there in your network the the, uh, the locations and assets that are always available those disappear and you have to make those for yourself which is why money becomes a very big factor but you can get that money easily if you've already honed the skill utilizing the value of the resources in front of you. So you got a nice house, you got a nice dorm, you've got good friends. Like that's, you yeah. can make something. You yeah. Make I, something. I mean, there's a whole freaking film department. I'm sure they have equipment that you can rent. There's a whole acting, there's a whole theater department filled with actors that want to act, you know? And so it's like, you are sitting on a literally like a once in a lifetime opportunity to make something. And in 10 years, you're going to be like, I should have made something, you know, like, why not also, learn? Okay. And probably good if it sucks, because if it sucks, then you know what you did wrong and you can walk yeah. into the next one, basically being like, well, I made something that sucks for free, which is the cheap, which is the best opportunity. If you can do a bunch of things that you realize, well, I'm bad at that. And that was a mistake. And this was a mistake. And they all costed you nothing in the end. You are winning big time because in the real world, you have to make those with major yeah. sacrifices. Having each mistake that, costs you thousands of dollars. Yeah, each right? mistake so costs you like, thousands of dollars. So if you if you have the resources, especially in a college environment, just go make something. It's okay if it sucks. <laughs> yeah, and but also like try and make it good. Like you yeah, know what I mean? Like it's like it good, but it, but yeah. if it sucks, it's like the next one's not going to suck as much. <laughs> I would say like. Though. <laughs> yeah, just make it, make it no matter what, but don't settle for it being shit. You know what I mean? It's like, I actually had like a one-on-one -on -one with a, a theater student a couple of weeks ago that wants to be a director. And she asked me the same question. I was like, go cast the best actors in the department. They're there. You know who they are. And they may not be your friends, but like, there's no reason why you're like, you know, like cast the people that are good, use the locations that are cool, get the best camera you can go watch a thousand YouTube videos about filmmaking and editing. You know, you could have a feature by the time, like your senior thesis could be a feature film without a doubt. And you could probably make it for less than five grand, you know, and it would probably be a cool little drama set on a college campus or not. <laughs> like you could fake it. Like that's the thing about filmmaking. Like it's all bullshit. Right. So it's like, you know, like, like how many sets could you provide in Warch campus center that don't look like a campus? Any other advice you'd like our listeners to take away from all this? Come see Dangerous. Yeah, come see Dangerous, <laughs> then get inspired to go make your own movie. So. Yeah, come ask us any questions that you want to ask us. Don't be like, oh, wow, I just want to go to bed today. Like, you know, you have you have an opportunity. Awesome. Right. Well, thank you for joining us, Jacob and yeah. Adam. I, I can't wait to see you in person in a couple weeks. Um, really excited for it. So thank you so much. Fantastic meeting you, Laura. Our pleasure. Have a great one.